What is sin? To be more specific, what is the nature of that sin for which we are considered guilty before God, condemned to be lost eternally? What is sin? This might seem like a strange subject when we are really talking about righteousness by faith, how to be saved, how to find salvation and freedom from sin. Why should we talk about sin? We want to know how to be free from sin, don't we? It's a little like going to a doctor's office. When you go to a doctor, you know that something's wrong. You can't quite get your finger on what's causing it. You feel not quite right. And when you go to that doctor, you expect more than just a cursory prescription. You expect an examination and you expect a diagnosis because, you see, we want to know the cause of the symptom. We don't want to know just how to solve the symptom that we're feeling. It's a little like that in righteousness by faith. Unless we know the cause for our disease, we will likely be applying the wrong remedy to a symptom. And so our subject is sin. What is it? What is its nature? Why are we guilty before God? A few years ago, I came across a very interesting book written back in 1945, published by the Nazarene Publishing House. The book is entitled, A Right Conception of Sin, written by Richard Taylor. And I'll share just a few sentences from this book. Sin, as one doctrine of the Christian system, is the common denominator of the other doctrines. The question of sin is so basically related to the nature of God and the plan of redemption, it is the one doctrine by which all others can be reduced to their simplest significance. Furthermore, it forms the surest and most logical measuring stick by which the accuracy of those doctrines can be detected. The doctrines relating to sin form the center around which we build our entire theological system. If our conception of sin is faulty, our whole superstructure will be one error built on another, each one more absurd than the last, yet each one necessary if it is to fit in consistently with the whole erroneous scheme. If we are to end right, we must begin right. Many, perhaps most, of the errors which have protruded themselves into Christian theology can be finally traced to a faulty conception of sin. Because someone's notions of sin were a bit off color, his entire trend of reasoning was misdirected. A theologian's ideas of sin may have only slight error, seemingly innocent, but that is sufficient to cause a distinct deviation in the line of his thinking and as his system develops, he is carried farther and farther on the wings of human fancy from the truth. To reason from a false premise is to start an endless chain of false conclusions. Therefore, we say that one who does not have correct views of sin is not apt to have correct views of any other fundamental question. This will especially be manifest in regard to his theory of the atonement and God's method of redeeming man. To insist on correct views of sin is to make it impossible to stray very far from essential truth. I believe he was right in his analysis. The, the doctrine of sin, the question that I asked, what is sin, is that basic premise, that bottom line, the common denominator. If our doctrine of sin is correct, we can build a correct gospel. But if our doctrine of sin is faulty, the whole gospel built upon that will be faulty as well. And so, what is sin? There are at least two current definitions of sin that are mainstream in Christian thinking. The first definition of sin, sin is the nature with which we are born, our very constitution, we are born into this world inheriting a fallen nature from Adam and Eve. Because of their sin, they passed on this fallen nature to all succeeding generations and every individual on the face of this earth. And because of this, 
our very nature is distorted. It isn't the way God designed it to be. The first definition of sin says that that is our sin and that is our guilt. Our being, create, our being born with a fallen nature. We are guilty before God not because of what we do or say or think. We are guilty before God because of who we are, because of our very construction with fallen human natures. And that means, of course, that everything we do in life is sin. Every act of our life is based upon a sinful nature. And therefore, sin is constant. It is ongoing until the time of death or glorification. Most of the Christian world believes that this is the correct definition of sin, that we stand guilty before God because of our nature, born that way, destined to be that way. I am suggesting that there is a second possible definition of sin. And that second definition says everything that the first definition says, namely that we are born in a fallen world, born to fallen parents, with a fallen nature inside us that leads us astray. It says all of those things, but it says we are not guilty before God because of an inheritance of all of these things. We do not stand condemned automatically at the moment of our birth because of our equipment, because of faulty equipment inherited from our parents. We stand guilty, this position says, because we choose against God because we choose to say no and use this faulty equipment in a way that will dishonor God. We choose to rebel against God. So once again, the two definitions of sin. First, we are guilty because of our nature, inherited from our parents. Second definition of sin, we are guilty because of our choices, made by free will in opposition to God's law and God's way of life. Those are the two definitions. Which is right? And how can we tell? In our first presentation, I said that I believe that the, de the definition of sin that is biblical is that it is by choice rather than by nature. I said that to believe that we are sinners by nature is a false premise that will lead ultimately to false conclusions about not only how a man is saved, but ultimately as to whether or not the law and the Sabbath are important in God's sight. And so, I'm going to try to show in this presentation why I believe that to be true. Why I believe that we are sinners by choice rather than by nature. First of all, we're going to have to establish a difference here in our speaking about sin. Sin is a broad category. It covers a number of, of different concepts about what is wrong, about what shouldn't be, and what is, is amiss in our world. Now, I'm going to subdivide sin now into two subcategories. The first one being evil, and the second one being guilt. Sin as evil and sin as guilt. Now, what do I mean by those subcategories? We have a lot of things wrong in our world that God didn't design. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, trees dying. All of these things are a result of sin. All part of the curse of sin. And yet we ascribe no guilt to the tornado. We ascribe no guilt to the hurricane or to the earthquake. We understand these as simply being results of, of living in a world of sin when calamity and destruction reign. Bring that down to the animal world just a bit. Some of you have a pet in your home that is a very strange pet to have. If you don't know about this pet, if you don't have this pet in your home, you know what I'm talking about. It's a cat. A very strange, comp, uh, 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 strange position for uh, a creature to have. On the one hand, very cuddly and warm and soft, very affectionate loving to cuddle up against uh, uh, on our laps on a cold winter evening, loving to rub up against our legs, knowing the rules of the house, knowing where it shouldn't go, knowing what it shouldn't do. And yet, you open the door to the out-of-doors, 
and you watch a change take place in the whole personality of that cat. Because, you see, indoors, your rules apply. Outdoors, its rules apply. And outdoors, it's really very simple. There are really only two rules that govern in the out-of-doors. You run from anything bigger than yourself, and you catch anything smaller than yourself. Life is very simple. Now, do you suppose that your little pet is going outdoors to admire the new rose bush that you labored over? that you watered and fertilized, and so it is, is bearing beautiful blossoms? Is it going out there to sit under the shade tree to admire the landscaping in your backyard? Or is it going out there with one purpose and one only in mind, to search out and destroy anything smaller than itself that it can find? Isn't that the reason? And when it does that, have you noticed that your sweet, lovable little pet that just was in your house, curled up on your lap, isn't quite so lovable when it finds that little mouse, when it finds that little gopher, when it finds that little animal that isn't able to defend itself. And have you noticed with the great glee and happiness that your cat tortures another animal to death? It doesn't kill it quickly. It plays with it. It, to it teases it. It hopes it'll hang on a little longer to life so it can play with it a little more until finally with a look of disappointment the game is over and the animal is dead. What do you do now when your little pet comes back to your back door, trophy in mouth, wanting praise, wanting to be welcomed back into your home? Do you lock it up? in jail for the rest of its life because it has done such a horrible thing out in your backyard? Or do you simply brush away the fur and the feathers or whatever else it might be and welcome it back into your house where it continues to go on its normal way of life? What has happened here? What has happened to a sweet, lovable little animal that has made it a vicious predator? willing to torture another animal to death for its own satisfaction. What has happened is that evil has happened in our world. Do we consider the cat guilty because it did that? Not for one moment. It had no way of choosing. It had no way of deciding whether that was a right or a wrong act. Instinct propelled it, and its instinct said, kill. That's my reason for being here. That's my function. And it killed very brutally. We recognize that fact. We recognize that that cat did not do something in a malicious way, even though it did something very brutal. But it did not do it with evil intent or motives. And so we welcome a killer back into our home because we make the distinction between what is evil and what is guilt. We even do it in the human situation, and we do it quite regularly. Stories appear in the newspapers and on television every now and then about a young toddler finding a strange new plaything in a bedroom drawer and finding that new plaything, suddenly a report goes off and a brother or su a sister lies dead or wounded because of the play of the toddler. Has evil happened? Very definitely. Do we ascribe guilt to the toddler? Under no circumstances. There is no trial. There is no judgment as to guilt or innocence. We don't even consider the question. But now, what happens when a 17-year-old finds that same gun in the same drawer and the same results happen? Do we pass it off quite as lightly as we did with a 2-year-old? Or now do we ask a question? The question, why? What really happened there? Was it an accident? If so, we treat it one way. But if the answer is, it was planned, it was premeditated, then a whole different system of laws and justice takes over. A whole court system comes into play because now we are judging guilt or innocence. So you see, my point simply is that every day of our lives, we are making a distinction between evil that exists in our world that cannot be helped but must be adjusted to and guilt for which we are personally responsible and which we eliminate wherever we can find it.
You live with evil. You eliminate guilt. And so I'm suggesting that right in our world, in our everyday life, we make a distinction between evil and guilt on a regular basis. The question is now, does the Bible make that distinction? Does the Bible teach that there is a difference between evil and guilt in our world? We're going to start back in the book of Genesis, right back in the beginning when God set this world up. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God gave his first command to his first two individuals on this earth. He said very simply, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, as we reflect on that command given by God, we might have a question mark come to our minds. Did God really mean what he said? In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve ate of the tree, didn't they? Adam and Eve didn't die that day, did they? So did God's promise fail? Did God make a mistake? Didn't he mean what he said? Or what is the solution? Why didn't Adam and Eve come under the death penalty that very day, just as God had said? Back in the opposite end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, is another text. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. In the last part of this verse, it speaks of a book of life. And the book of life is, the, is, is called the book of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And now we ask, what does that mean? Because Jesus really didn't die at the foundation of the world, did he? He died 2,000 years after the foundation of the world. So what, what do we really mean here? We have a text that says that in the day you eat, you will die. And we have another text that says Jesus was slain at the very foundation of the world. How does that help to solve our problem? How does that help to, uh, to resolve our dilemma? In the Ellen White comments on some of the verses we have been talking about, there are some fascinating descriptions of this time. In Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1082, 1084, and 1085 are these words. Why was not the death penalty at once enforced in his case? That's Adam. Because a ransom was found. God's only begotten Son volunteered to take the sin of men upon himself and to make an atonement for the fallen race. Now notice that carefully. Why didn't they die that day? Genesis 2 said they should have died that day. Because a ransom was found, God's only begotten Son, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Reading again. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Now let's notice that very carefully. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan, that's before man has repented. That's before man even understands that he's done anything wrong. The instant he sins, that instant, Christ stands between the living and the dead. Now who's alive and who's dead? No one has died in this universe. Not one leaf has fallen from the first tree. The only possible meaning is that Adam and Eve are one heartbeat away from death. And Christ steps in immediately and says, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. I don't know about you, but if I were sentenced to die, capital punishment, without any hope of pardon, no reprieve, I think I would rather die next week than next year. To look forward to the execution of a death sentence may be the most awful thing that can be imagined by human mind. And yet what we're reading here is that when Jesus Christ stepped in between the living and the dead and took the punishment upon himself, Calvary was certain and there was no way out. There was no reprieve. There was no pardon. He was on his way to execution.
Not for one year, not for two years, but for 4,000 years he stood on death row, seeing every event of Calvary, going over it and over it in his omniscient mind, knowing exactly what he was going to experience because he took the death penalty in the Garden of Eden. The Lamb, yes, he was slain from the foundation of the world in a very significant sense. As soon as there was sin, reading again, there was a Savior. As soon as Adam sinned, please notice, not as soon as Adam repented. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as surety for the human race with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross of Calvary. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. A Savior for the human race, with power to avert their doom, power to give them a second chance. He shall have another chance, Jesus said about Adam and Eve. That's what Jesus Christ bought for Adam and Eve and for every human being in the Garden of Eden that day, a second chance. Some things had to remain because of sin, but some things he removed. Over in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5 is a fascinating chapter, and I believe it says something about what we're talking about right here in terms of what Jesus Christ did for every human being on the face of this earth. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, it says this, Therefore, as by the offense of one, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's all Adam could offer. He didn't have righteousness to offer men. All he had to offer was condemnation and guilt and sin. So, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that's Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Justification reverses condemnation. If we are condemned by Adam's sin, we are freed from that condemnation by Christ's sinless life and atoning death. Condemnation reversed by justification for all men. You see, the point I'm making is that Jesus Christ did this for Adam and Eve before they chose to repent. He did it at the moment of their sin. He did it to give them a second chance to make that decision over again. And I am proposing that we have just read in Romans chapter 5 that he has done that not just for Adam and Eve, but for every human being born into this world. So that when a baby is born, a baby comes into this world not under the condemnation and sentence of death, but under the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. And that baby has a second chance to decide, given to him by Jesus Christ. And so, if we would put that into our little diagram here of sin and guilt. Sin produces evil. It causes negative effects to happen in our world. It causes the tornadoes and the earthquakes and the fallen nature. It causes the, the terrible tragedy in the animal world. It causes all of the things that we talked about. And it leads to something called the first death. The first death... Jesus described as asleep. It is the result of being born into a world in which evil reigns. The first death is not removed from anyone, be it animal or human. Jesus Christ, when he stepped in and did something for Adam and Eve, did not remove the evil in the world. He did not remove the first death. He did not remove the curse or the result of sin. But now, on the other side, the guilt of sin leads to not the first death, but the second death. The death which is the final annihilation of those whom God created in his own image from the presence of God himself. This is not the natural result of evil in our world, but now the penalty for sin. Guilt leads to eternal death, the penalty for sin. Evil leads to the first death or the result of sin. 
So we have two different results, two different aspects of sin. Jesus Christ took the, the second away, but he left the first. In fact, if we want to add one more thing now to our picture that we've been describing thus far, the atonement of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ came to this world and died for man's sins, The atonement covers all aspects of sin. The atonement is far stronger than anything that sin could do. And it covers not only the evil of sin, but the guilt of sin. But it handles, the atonement of Jesus Christ handles the evil and the guilt in totally different ways. It is not the same process at all. It is not the, 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 doing the, the same thing to both sides. What does Jesus Christ's death do for the guilt of a sinner? It forgives it. Jesus' death on the cross forgives a guilty sinner. It removes it. He can't change the past, and so he forgives our guilt. He removes the penalty. And for one who has accepted the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no second death. There is no penalty for sin. There is no guilt. Guilt is removed totally by the atonement, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But now, what about the evil of sin? Does God remove the evil that is all around us when we come to him and are born again? Does God remove the first death from us? I'm afraid it's all too true that even those who have been born again and are living without guilt in their lives, still may die tragically by sickness or accident. Still all around us are the influences of evil. And so God does not remove the evil at the time of the new birth. He does not remove evil by conversion. Evil is removed only at the end of this world's history. When God recreates that which is cursed by evil and makes it beautiful and holy once again. And the first death is removed and all of the results of sin are removed from our experience. So God recreates that which is evil at the end of this world. God forgives that for which we stand under guilt and condemnation now immediately. So sin... Two different aspects, the atonement handling those two different aspects with completely different solutions so that God can solve the problem of sin in a broad way. Can we show from the Bible that, in fact, this little description that we have given is the way the Bible treats and talks about this subject of sin and our guilt? I'm going to go to a couple of New Testament texts now, right to the experience of Jesus Christ in which he is talking about this very subject. In Luke 13, verses 1 to 5, are two very interesting stories that Jesus tells. And they bear right on what we're talking about here. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now what had happened? These Galileans had come down to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices, and Pilate and the authorities of Rome believed that they were there for rebellion, not for worship, and he killed them right on the spot. A massacre took place. It was front page news. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Notice his question. Do you think they're greater sinners than the rest because they were massacred, they were put to death? And the answer of the people to whom he was speaking would be yes. After all, they're dead, we're alive. That means they are under God's condemnation and we're better off than they are. Look at Jesus' answer here. Jesus says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. They did not die because they were greater sinners than anyone else. He goes on with another story to make his point over again. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. These were workmen rebuilding an old tower. And the tower fell down and killed them all. 18 men. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? And once again their answer would be, they must have been, because after all they were punished with death. Therefore that proves them guilty. 
And Jesus said again, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus is trying to say that an accidental death, as tragic as that may be, is not proof of guilt. The first death, the first death is not proof of an individual's guilt before God. These two are not related. Our guilt does not lead to the first death. The first death is in the world because of evil and its results which come to those who believe in God and those who do not believe in God, sometimes quite in the same way. And so, first death and guilt, Jesus says, are not directly related. Let's go on to another story that Jesus tells. It's in the book of John. John chapter 9, a very familiar story. John chapter 9, verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, notice their question, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you catch their question? Here is a man with a physical disability. That proves that guilt was involved somewhere in this picture. Someone sinned. Therefore, he was paying the penalty for someone's sin. Now, Lord, they were saying, help us out. Who sinned? Did this man sin before he was born in his mother's womb? Or did his parents sin and he was paying the penalty for their sin? He was being punished by God for their sin. Who did sin? that he was born blind, and notice Jesus' answer, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. This man was not born blind because of the guilt of himself or the guilt of his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Jesus is saying that here we have a case of evil results in this man's life, born blind because of a world of sin. And right now, I am going to do a little work of recreation before your eyes. What happened in this story is that Jesus recreated the man's sight so that he was no longer blind, just as he will recreate all evil at the end of time. He gave us a little foretaste of how he deals with evil in the world. He recreates it and makes it perfect, makes it right. He didn't forgive this man for his blindness because there was nothing to be forgiven. And I am saying that he does not forgive us for our fallen natures because there is nothing to be forgiven about fallen natures. That's part of being born with the results of sin in an evil world. In John chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, Jesus makes a very interesting statement here. It sounds contradictory at first, at first reading. In verse 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Marvelous promise. That the one that believes has everlasting life and will not die. He will not come into condemnation. He is passed from death unto life. But now notice the next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Now what, what dead are those? They're the same dead that he has said would not die in the previous verse. They're the ones who have everlasting life. They're the ones who believe on him that sent me. And now he says, they'll be dead. They'll be in their graves. And they'll hear the voice of the Son of God. And they will live. All right, let's look at our diagram here for just a moment. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. No more guilt. No more second death. The one that believes on me has everlasting life. And guilt is blotted out for all eternity. He is passed from death unto life. But that same one who believes in the one who sent me will be dead and will be raised by the voice of the Son of God. They will hear the voice of the Son of God because they do not any longer have the guilt of sin, even though they have within them an evil nature, 
even though evil may befall them in their lives. They that hear shall live. Verse 24 is talking about Jesus' solution for the guilt of man's sin. Verse 25 is talking about his solution for the evil in our world and how he solves it. There are two deaths with all the difference in the world in meaning between those two deaths. Can we show conclusively, without any shadow of doubt, that we stand guilty before God because of our choices, not because of our nature, not because of the way we are born. In this same book, the book of John, John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking about the Pharisees, those that uh, opposed him on many occasions when he tried to give the word of God to them. And in verse 22 of John chapter 15, he says, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now, now, after I've spoken, they have no cloak for their sin. Verse 24, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. If I hadn't come, no sin. Because no rejection of light. No rejection of light. What turns evil into guilt? What changes the evil around us and in us into condemnation, into guilt for every one of us? The thing that changes it is light and choice. Based on that light, that turns evil into guilt. And we become guilty because of that light available and choices made on the basis of that. According to this text that we just read, another text which says virtually the same thing is John chapter 9, verse 41. John 9, 41, Jesus said unto them, to the Pharisees, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth clear, isn't it? If we see, if we understand, then we stand guilty of our own choice to sin against God. But if you were blind, you would have no sin. Now, were these Pharisees born in an evil world with evil natures? Yes, they were. But Jesus said, if you were blind, if you did not have light, you would have no sin in the sense of guilt. Yes, these Pharisees were born in an evil world with evil natures, but what made them guilty sinners in the sight of God was the light that had come to them and the choices they made based upon that light. To be born with faulty equipment is not to be born guilty. One further step must take place before guilt enters the picture. Turn to the book of James. James chapter 4 and verse 17. Very simple, concise statement that just says succinctly everything I'm wanting to say today. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To the one who knows and understands God's will and refuses to obey, to that person it is sin. Not to the one who does not know. Not to the one who simply is involved in an evil world having an evil nature. In the first chapter of the book of James is the most concise definition of sin and temptation that I have found in the Bible. And it is a description that many Christians are not clear on. Let's look carefully at James chapter 1, verse 14. James 1, verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now the word lust means a desire for anything out of harmony with the will of God. When he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed by them. Now that's temptation. Sometimes I wonder if we have the correct definition of temptation. We say temptations are those things out there in the world. The billboards that we see. What people talk about. What we hear about on radio or television. Those are temptations. I'm not so sure. Do all of the things that you hear, read about, or see attract you? Or are there some things that you hear or see that don't attract you in the least? 
And that isn't because you're a Christian. They simply don't appeal to anything within your personality. You find no interest in it at all. In fact, you couldn't think of enough money to be paid you to participate in that particular activity. Isn't that true? Why, those aren't temptations at all. Those are only possible stimuli to temptation. Satan has many of them because he hopes that a few of those stimuli will trap us. Now, what is a temptation? When a particular stimulus out there in the world at large hits right straight through into my mind, penetrates into my mind, and I find it attractive, I find it of interest, I am drawn a bit to think about that. That is a temptation. That's a temptation. Notice again what it says. When he is drawn away of his own desire and enticed. Going back to our diagram. These are not good desires in all cases. Some of them come directly from Adam's fall and are part of our fallen nature. And so we're attracted by desires within us that are not the best. They are evil. And it says that we are tempted when we are drawn by these desires. Please notice, this is crucial, that is not sin. That is temptation. In the first definition of sin that I mentioned, sin by nature, the one that most Christians believe in, that's sin. Whether or not you yield to it or not. Whether or not you agree to participate in it. Just the fact that your nature was drawn by that particular temptation makes you a sinner. No matter if you say no to it in the end. That's what definition one says. The definition that we are sinners by nature. I don't believe that's biblical. I believe that definition number two, the one that says we are sinners by choice, is what we're talking about here because verse 15 now says, Then when lust, this desire, this evil within us, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. You see, this desire, this within our nature, has to take one more step before it becomes sin. And that one more step is to conceive, just as in birth, to conceive. We're going to find, in just a few moments, an inspired definition for what conceiving is, for what turns this evil into guilt, for what turns the pull of an evil nature of desires within us into sin and guilt, for which we stand under condemnation. But James 1 just says simply that there is a difference between temptation and sin. We are tempted by the things within us. That's not sin. We do not stand under guilt for that. We sin when that temptation, that pull within us, conceives, when it conceives. In the book of Ezekiel is a clear statement as well about the subject that we are considering. Are we born under condemnation? In verse 20 of Ezekiel 18, it simply says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The soul that sins shall die. That's the Bible principle. Not the soul that inherits sin. The soul that sins will die eternally. In the book of Matthew is a very, very unique statement made by Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verses 23 and 24. Picture this now in your mind. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. How could Jesus make an incredible statement like that? How could he say that Sodom stands under more condemnation than Capernaum? Where would you choose to raise your family, Sodom or Capernaum? Where is the place of law and order? Where is the place where schools are in, 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 in good repair and teachers are doing the best they can? Sodom or Capernaum? And yet, Jesus says, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for Capernaum. 
Now Sodom, I am quite sure, had a great deal more evil in terms of acts being carried on in its streets on a day-by-day -day basis. But Capernaum had the light of the world and made their choice based on that light. Therefore, Jesus says that their guilt and their condemnation far outweighs the guilt that will come to Sodom. Once again, do you see? Evil and guilt are not the same concepts. We stand guilty because of light rejected, knowledge of God's will in which we turn from it. A few statements now that I have found extremely important and rather profound on this subject from the writings of Ellen White that I wish to share with you. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 306, is this simple statement. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing. Consequences of parental wrongdoing. Did Adam do wrong when he sinned? Of course. Did that lead to consequences? Of course. Does it lead in certain cases to blindness and other inherited diseases that we can talk about? Of course. And it leads, in fact, to the first death. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing, but they are not punished for the parent's guilt. Adam's guilt. They are not punished for the parent's guilt except as they participate in their sins. That's when punishment for guilt takes place. When we choose to participate with light available to us and we choose to do the same things that our parents did, then we are punished for guilt. But now it's not our parents' guilt any longer, it's our guilt. We stand under condemnation for that. In Gospel Workers, page 162 is another simple statement. Light makes manifest and reproves the errors that were concealed in darkness. And as light comes, the life and character of men must change correspondingly to be in harmony with it. Please notice, sins that were once sins of ignorance because of the blindness of the mind can no more be indulged in without incurring guilt. Yes, it is possible to do wrong things when you don't know that they're wrong. And there is no guilt for that. Jesus, in his atonement, has covered that. But because we know, because light has come, therefore guilt is applied when we reject that light. In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 177, is a very interesting statement. The sin of evil speaking begins with the cherishing of evil thoughts. Guile includes impurity in all its forms. Now notice carefully what we're going to say here. An impure thought tolerated, an unholy desire cherished, and the soul is contaminated, its integrity compromised. Now please notice, an impure thought. Where are we going to put that in our diagram here? Why, right here, of course. An impure thought is not the way God created Adam. But because of evil resulting from Adam's sin and the consequences of evil, there are impure thoughts that were not part of God's plan. There are unholy desires, impure thoughts and unholy desires, all part of evil and all part of what James 1.14 talked about as being those desires that entice from within. They don't come from out there. They come from within here, within our minds. And so the impure thought and the unholy desire is clearly evil. But is the soul contaminated because of that? Not according to this statement. It says, an impure thought tolerated. That is a choice that we are making. You cannot choose whether or not there will be impure thoughts in your nature. You get them automatically. But you can choose whether you tolerate that and make it your thought. You can't choose whether or not there will be unholy desires in your nature. They are there automatically. But you can choose to cherish it. You can choose to hold on to it, and that is what contaminates the soul. That is what compromises its integrity. That is the prime difference that we're speaking about here, that we are not guilty because of nature. 
That's definition one, remember? We're guilty because of nature, definition one says, which means that we would be guilty because of having this evil nature. We would be guilty whether or not we ever chose anything. The definition of sin that forms the foundation for a whole system of righteousness by faith, which the most of, most of the Christian world believes in, is totally false, my friends. It is a definition which has us sinning every second of our life in every breath we take because we have these evil natures within us. And whether or not we choose is relatively unimportant. We stand guilty, definition one says, because of who we are. No, my friends, that's not the Bible definition of sin. The Bible definition of sin is that evil turns to guilt because of cherishing. Remember I said we would find an inspired definition for the word conceive in James 1, verse 15? That when lust conceives, it brings forth sin? Here is the word, cherish. Cherish. That's the inspired definition for conceiving. It happens up here in the mind. We don't sin by what we do, we sin by what we think by what we choose, by our conception in our very minds. If we would not commit sin, we must shun its very beginnings. No man can be forced to transgress his own consent. Notice that word again. His own consent must be first gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion, that's over here, passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. The soul must purpose the sinful act. His own consent must be first gained. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. Temptation and sin are important, have important distinctions that if we blur them, we make the foundation for righteousness by faith very unsafe to build on. In Testimonies, Volume 1, page 116, is this statement. Said the angel, if light comes and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. I wonder how the English language could be any plainer on the subject, my friends. Before the light comes, there is no sin. There's a lot of evil. And there is evil within our natures, but there is no sin. Where there is no light. Light and sin are bound together permanently by God. And then the one which gives a statement which gives me a great deal of encouragement. Review and Herald, March 27, 1888. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished, that's the key. If they are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt, and no other is defiled by their influence. There's God's answer. God's answer to being born in a bad world, an evil world, a world which is contaminated with all of the results of sin for, for 6,000 years. All of these thoughts and feelings that annoy even the best of men, if they are repulsed, if we choose against them, the soul is not contaminated with guilt. God does not condemn because of equipment. He condemns because of disloyalty. He condemns because our wills are set in opposition to God's will. He does not condemn because of bad air or bad water or bad natures. He condemns because of willful rebellion against His holy law. And so... I have good news, and I have bad news for you this morning. The good news is not one of us stand under condemnation because Adam brought sin into this world. Jesus Christ took care of that. Jesus Christ is the second Adam, and we stand under that flag, the flag of the blood of Jesus Christ when we're born. He did it for all men. So we do not stand guilty for Adam's sin. That was removed by Jesus Christ. The good news is, is we stand free with a second chance to choose for ourselves whom we will obey. The bad news? We can no longer blame that outburst of temper on our Irish heritage. The excuses are gone. When we sin, we choose to sin. When we sin, we make our choice and we say no to God and it is our responsibility. We can't cast the blame on anyone else. 
The devil doesn't make us do it. I'm only human doesn't work anymore. We have a choice. We have a responsibility in the sight of God. And so, the bottom line, the basic premise, the foundation upon which the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ can be built safely is the premise that we stand guilty because of the rejection of light. We stand condemned because we said no to Jesus Christ and to God's way. And that's what we need a remedy for. That's what the gospel must be applied to. Not our nature, but our mind. The gospel and the remedy for sin must apply to the choices I make in my mind. God will take care of the problems of nature and evil in his own good time. But right now, the gospel must apply to my mind and my choices. That's the foundation. Now we can talk about how men are saved from sin.